Tag allerseits. Das freut mich sehr, dass die Bude hier voll ist, ähm, weil es mir eine große Ehre und ein Vergnügen gleichermaßen ist, jetzt gleich mit jemandem sprechen zu dürfen, der meine musikalische Sozialisation wie kaum jemand anderer geprägt hat. Ohne ihn wird es etliche meiner Lieblingsbands vermutlich überhaupt nicht geben. Vielen von euch wird es da ähnlich gehen. Meine Damen und Herren, Daniel Miller. Grüezi. Das Gespräch wird aufgeteilt sein in drei Teile, die wirklich sehr übersichtlich sind, nämlich Vergangenheit, Gegenwart und Zukunft. Ja, da kommt auch jeder mit, ihr werdet jetzt merken, wann wir über was reden. Um, our talk will be uh, very well structured, there is past, present and future. Okay. Um, now Daniel, first of all, um, You in Switzerland, that's a special relationship anyway. What, what makes it so special? Well, I, um, a number of things. I worked here uh, in, in Switzerland in the early 70s for a couple of years in Zermatt in a ski resort. Uh, I was a, a DJ in a hotel. And um, I love the mountains anyway. And, and uh, it was a, a really great experience. I played a kind of, it was a really tourist kind of a hotel, obviously. It's a tourist resort. So it was very pop, kind of orientated, What current chart hits. Oh, that time, ABBA. Yeah, ABBA. <laughs> lots of really weird, different, weird combinations of things. ABBA, Status Quo, uh, the Commodores, Fatback Band. Uh, it was before disco, really. Mm -hmm. So um, Deep Purple, Johnny Rivers, all sorts of things. That none <laughs> of you, most of you probably never heard of most of that. Anyway, so yes, that's my relationship. Uh, kind of a special relationship with uh, with Switzerland but also you know I love the, I love the mountains in general and obviously the, it's a beautiful it's, it's a beautiful place to go to the mountains so you have an opportunity to go there uh, today tomorrow yep uh, that's perfect yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> um, so around that time um, you started getting fascinated by electronic music uh, during a time where uh, punk music was the thing in England. Um, why is it that you got fascinated by electronic music? Was it that you got bored by punk? Well, I was, I was fascinated, I was interested in electronic music long before punk, really from the late 60s onwards, uh, when um, I first started to hear electronics being used in an interesting way in, uh, in contemporary music. So, um, You know, with when I first started hearing groups like Can and Faust and those and Armand Duhl and early Kraftwerk, It's all German stuff. Funnily enough, all <laughs> German stuff. Yeah, um, there were very few bands in the UK or America using electronics in an interesting way. Uh, there were, of course, people using it, but and Pink Floyd had used it in an interesting way earlier, um, and that sparked my interest because you know I grew up in the 60s which was an incredibly progressive time for music. Between 19, I mean, I was a kid, but between 1963 and 1967, music changed beyond recognition over that period of time, you know, from the very first Beatles tracks to kind of psychedelia. In a very, very short time, things don't happen like that anymore. And I was kind of on that moment, that, cur that kind of progressive curve, I was a huge music fan. But I found that what was going on in the UK and America was kind of slowing down. I wasn't that interested in where it was going. And I thought the new source of progression was coming from Germany. And then you figured you want to play music yourself. And uh, in order to release it, you had to found a label. Was that the mm. connection? Well, I, so to go forward to 1976, 1977, mm -hmm. which was the, when punk started to happen, I was really excited by the idea of punk. Not so much the, mu the music partly, but mostly the idea of it. People, you know, music was really in a bad way in those days. So something like punk, which was very raw, you didn't really have to play the instruments very well. It was completely against what was going on. It kind of wiped the, sh the slate clean. And that inspired me, really. Um, I'd always played music. I was a really bad guitarist and bad saxophone player. <laughs> and I wanted, always wanted to play with electronic music, but unfortunately, you know, that time to buy a synthesizer was very, really expensive and out of the kind of range of a normal person. And so 
But around, 60, around 77, 676, 70, the cheaper synthesizers started to come out from Japan. So I managed to get hold of a second-hand Korg. And I was inspired to do stuff myself because the, the, a lot of the, the, sur the things that surrounded the punk culture was a do-it-yourself culture. And that was inspiring. You, you know, you started reading about people putting records out on their own labels, doing everything themselves, the pressing, the printing, and everything. And I was inspired by that, and I was inspired by electronic music, and I saw a real link in my head between punk and electronic music, mm -hmm. the kind of raw simplicity of it. And so I just started messing around at home uh, with my synthesizer and tape recorder, and um, I found that I quite enjoyed it, and I could express my musical ideas with that much better than I ever could playing guitar. And then I got a couple of tracks together which I thought were okay, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to put them out. You know, I didn't really start a label, I just put out a single, which is not the same thing as starting a record. I mean, you have to do the processes of uh, a label. You have to get the sleeve printed, you have to get the record mastered and pressed. But that's really what, that's really what happened. Um, the first thing you recorded and then put out as a single eventually was uh, TVOD and Warm Leather Red. Um, how long did it take to record these two songs? Well, I, I had to record them both in... I mean, I, I had to record them both in one day because I hired an extra little bit of equipment which I could only afford for one day, so I had to make sure everything was done within that day. I'd written, kind of written, the, the lyrics, so, so to speak, but that was all. I hadn't, and I hadn't, I'd done various versions, but I hadn't really finished... It all happened really in one day, 24-hour period, yeah. So, um, when it was released, uh, how were the reactions, uh, I mean, press-wise and from uh, punk fans at that time? Well, I was shocked because, um, you know, I did it. I, th I, I, I uh, didn't expect anybody to like it. I just did it for myself, really, to, fe to see what it would feel like to release a record. And weirdly enough, people seemed to like it because it was kind of very much outside of what people were listening to. There was very... It was, there was no real, it was just that a beginning of, you know, Throbbing Gristle were doing things, but there were no Human League or Cabaret Voltaire records at that time. So it was very early in that post-punk electronic era. And I just thought people wouldn't even listen to it, and if they did listen to it, they wouldn't like it. But actually, it got really good reviews in the, there were just four music papers then in the weekly papers, in, you know, that everybody read, and it got really good reviews in all of them. And the pinnacle of my... Uh, the pinnacle of you know my my happiness was that John Peel played it, and that f for me was a very important uh, moment. You know because we'd all we uh, my generation and generations beyond me grew up being influenced really heavily influenced by what John Peel was playing. So when he played my single, that was like a big moment for me. Of course. Yeah. And then you went on tour with uh, Stiff Little Fingers. Um, how was the live experience? Well, what happened was that I had no intention to play live. Um, I didn't know how to, I would do it, and I was asked to. Uh, there was a there was a, a company, a promotion company called Final Solution, who wanted to do a concert in a small club with all the new electronic, because there was a few at, by that time new electronic artists. One of the other people they invited was a, a guy called Robert Rental, mm -hmm. who also put out his own single at roughly the same time as me. And I'd met him afterwards. We became quite friendly. So we decided to do it together. We kind of little formed a little band, a duo. So we did that, and then we then that was one gig, and then we did the tour with Stiff Little Fingers, which was pretty interesting. I mean, the punk ninety eight percent of the people hated us, and spat. You know, we were every night we came off stage covered in spit and <laughs> cigarette burns, and they threw chains, and but there were two percent who were really inspired by it and came backstage and talked and had so many questions about how did we make the music and that was really great that the two percent of the people that there were people who actually I felt were inspired by what we did and that was the, that was very enjoyable now um, I picked uh, five songs for today's talk uh, songs that I consider signature tracks in a way mm -hmm. uh, for mute records um, ich habe ähm, für das Gespräch fünf Songs ausgesucht. Äh, Daniel weiß nicht, welche genau ich ausgesucht habe. Er wollte sich überraschen lassen. Es sind äh, Songs, von denen ich denke, dass sie fürs Label, ähm, 
für Daniel oder für mich <lacht> ganz wichtig waren. Und äh, jetzt könnt ihr euch wahrscheinlich schon denken, welcher der erste Song sein wird. Äh, The Normal, Warm Leather Red. Jawohl. Timeless classic, which I include in my techno sets once in a while. All right, okay. It still works fantastically. Mm. Um, so this record came out, and um, you had your address printed on a sleeve, right? Yes, that's right. I mean, I, th I, I did it. I don't know why. I just did. I didn't really know what to do, and I bought the first Rough Trade single, which had come out just before I put my single out, uh, which was by a French group called Metal Urbain. And I just thought, well, if Rough Trade, I just said, oh, well, I'll do it how they did it, and they put their address on it. I didn't even really think about it, I just put the, the address on it. <laughs> and so people thought that it was a record label. When it wasn't a record label, it was just me putting out one single. And I started to get demos, which was, uh, kind of a weird experience, I have to say. <laughs> was that, that actually, that got, getting sent demos made you uh, doing a record label eventually? Not, not, well, not really. I mean, I, I, the record, my, the single came out in seven, um, like spring 1978. Um, and then I did touring and I had to take care of getting pressings done and all that kind of stuff. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, to be honest, because I originally I thought I was just going to go back to my old job, but I was quite 
because the record was, you know, quite successful in an underground way, I was enjoying it, and I enjoyed the process and everything. And eventually, I I met um, an artist. Uh, I was introduced to an artist called Fad Gadget about a year after I started by a mutual friend, and he played me his demos. And actually, that was of all the demos I'd heard in the year, that was something that I could really relate to, both musically and lyrically. And you know, we talked. Frank Tovey, who was Fad Gadget, and I talked, and I said, "Why don't we just put a single out?" And that kind of, I didn't think about it, other than that's, I guess that's when the label really started, as a label, working with other people. Now, um, during the first years, um, you were still living with your mom, right? Yeah. Um, so you had this record label basically run in her, in her apartment? In my bed, out of my bedroom, yeah. yeah. Where did you put the records? Well, there weren't that, well, under the bed, <laughs> but mostly in, <laughs> but, well, no, we're, we're rough, the Rough Trade uh, were distributing it then. So... They, uh, they took care of the, the storage mm -hmm. of the records, so that was lucky, yeah. Uh, and, and when you got sent demos and the postman rang, was it your mom that had to open the door and get, get these demos? Um, well, I, you know, they, kept, they, they went through the letterbox <laughs> normally. I mean, there were cassettes, they went through the letterbox. It wasn't a problem. <laughs> very anyway, she was, she was very supportive of, every, of what I was doing, so it, mm -hmm. wasn't, it, was, it was good from that point of view, yeah. yeah. Um, Now, that we, we press fast forward, uh, mm -hmm. but just a little, um, and uh, we hit the fifth single, I believe, that was released on mute mm -hmm. um, by a German band called DAF, Deutsche Amerikanische Freundschaft. Yeah. Um, I'd say we have a listen to it, and then we, we talk about sure. DAF. Uh, here sind uh, die, also die Deutsche Amerikanische Freundschaft mit uh, Kebab-Träume. <lacht> Oh. 
Ja. Killer Groove nach wie vor. Ähm, eine der ersten Platten, die ich mir überhaupt gekauft habe. Erste Singles und äh, auch eine der ersten Platten, zu denen ich getanzt habe in der Dorfdisco. Äh, ich musste die Platte natürlich selbst von zu Hause mitnehmen. Die hatte der DJ nicht, aber hat abgesehen davon super funktioniert. Ich war immer der Einzige, der getanzt hat. Ähm, It's actually one of the first records I bought in my life uh, and one of the first records I danced to um, in, in the small disco they had in this Bavarian village where I come from. And I, the DJ didn't have the record, uh, so I, I brought it myself and I was the only person dancing to it, but <laughs> I was enjoying it. Um, now, uh, Duff, a very controversial German band, um, how did they end up on mute? Because uh, Their record, Die Kleinen und die Bösen, the album, was the first album to be released on, on Mute, right? Correct, yeah. Um, they ended up on Mute. I don't know, we are, again, I think that there, was a guy, there was a guy who was managing them at the time, who I vaguely knew, and he introduced us again, and I thought it was very interesting. I, I didn't know, you know, I had a, you know, I had a long history of uh, loving German music, mm. and this was the first kind of post-punk thing that I'd heard from Germany. And I actually thought it was great. And so, you know, it was really simple. I thought it was really good, let's put out a single. And then um, at a certain point, you know, I, I can't even remember when that was, I guess that was late 1979 or early 1980. Um, I thought it's time we did some albums because we'd only done singles up to that point. And I'd, wanted the first album to be Deutsche Amerikanische Freundschaft because I wanted it to be German. I wanted the first album to be German as a kind of thank you to German music that had inspired me so much in a way. But also it was the first album that we had ready to re to release. So um, I was very pleased to be able to put that out as the first album on mute. Um, And it was produced by the legendary Connie Plank. Connie Plank, yeah. Who actually of all the producers out there, he was, he was my hero as a producer. He produced some of the best records, and you know, my, some of my favorite records. So to be able to work with him was a real honor and a real pleasure. And I learned, we did it the whole album in two days, and I learned so much from him in those two days, it was incredible. Um, the fifth album to be released on mute was uh, Speak and Spell by Depeche. Um, Dreaming of Me was uh, the 13th single, Correct. And it came out in February 81, right? Yep. Um, so, speaking about Depeche Mode, um, how did you discover them? How did you find them? They, uh, Fad Gadget, who was, we talked about before, he was doing a gig in um, a pub in East London called The Bridge House, uh, which was quite a famous venue uh, in those days for, for music. And the, the promoter, the, local, well, the, the landlord of the pub, who also promoted the shows, he put Depeche Mode on as a support artist for Fat Gadget. And I, I hung around to watch the support artist. I got, sorry. I, I, uh, I hung around to, uh, uh, to watch the support act, which I didn't often do, but I happened to do it. Luckily, I did it that time. And um, I, I thought they were amazing from the first, pretty much the first moment, first note they played. I thought they had really had something special. Um, they were very, very young at the time, 17, 18. They had three simple synthesizers perched on beer crates. Um, <laughs> they had a little drum machine. They had uh, the lead singer who stood completely still throughout the show, had a light under light that kind of lit him to make him look quite gothy. And they had incredible songs incredibly well arranged. I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing, to be honest, at the time. And so I went backstage afterwards and I, I said, uh, when are you playing again? I'd love to see you again. And they were playing again at that venue, supporting somebody else. So I went back the following week and I was convinced. I mean, I was kind of convinced before, but I had to kind of pinch myself. And I said, would you like to put out a single? They said, yeah, okay. So we put out a single <laughs> and that was it. And we didn't have a contract for about 15 years. We work without a contract. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is a real testament to the band, really, that they, that they felt the trust to be able to carry on in that way. Because mm -hmm. we started off, it was successful quite quickly, 
And we thought, well, let's not fiddle around, let's just carry on a profit share deal. All the deals in those days that I did were profit share deals. And none, no, none of the artists had contracts. No lawyers involved, no managers involved. It's like a sort of clear process, you know. <laughs> yeah. So can that also go? Now, when you heard them playing, um, they were quite different from uh, the experimental stuff that you were listening to at the time and doing and playing yourself. Mm -hmm. Did you consider them being, I don't know, pop music right when you heard them? Yeah, I thought they were a revolutionary pop band mm -hmm. because, you know, you have to look at the context. There were, you know, of course, there were people like me and like Cabaret Voltaire and even at that time Human League, although, of course, they went on to be a big pop band, but at that time they weren't really. Mm -hmm kind of art schooly, kind of, uh, you know, arty kind of people. And Depeche Mode were just very raw. They were, came from a very different background. They, did, you know, they, they had the choice, should we be a guitar band or should we be a, an electronic band? And they decided to be an electronic band. And they were one of the first of that generation, because although none of us were that old, they were still like five years younger than, five or six years younger than me. And I thought it was revolutionary. That's, and, you know, it was the, for me, it was very futuristic. It was the future where kids were in a position to say, well, I'd, I'm not going to buy a guitar or a drum kit. I'm going to buy a synthesizer. And for me, that was a very important, apart from the music, which was great, obviously. They were kind of a revolutionary pop band in that sense. Of course, we have to listen to it now. Okay. The <laughs> erste um, single, die jemals bei Mute erschien von Depeche Mode, Katalog Nummer 5, Dreaming of You. Uh, me, of course.
unfassbare 33 Jahre alt, äh, wenn ich mich nicht verrechnet habe, klingt, als wäre es gestern produziert worden. Wahnsinn. Ähm, die erste Band, von der ich jemals ein Poster in meinem Zimmer hängen hatte. Und ein T-Shirt, das muss ich mir aber selber machen, gab es damals noch nicht zu kaufen. Ähm, noch ein kleiner Hinweis, bevor wir fortfahren. Es ist, das habt ihr vielleicht im Programmheft entnommen, ja immer eine Simultan-Dolmetschung, sagt man es so. Äh, Verdolmetschung, äh, erhältlich, <lacht> in Anspruch nehmbar. Ähm, wer, wer nimmt die denn in Anspruch? Niemand, ihr könnt ein Päuschen machen, <lacht> oder? Okay. Everybody understands us. This, this is cool. So, no door matching. Um, so, the, the 80s and 90s, I mean, apart from the Britpop era, maybe, uh, were great uh, for mute records with uh, artists like Depeche and Erasure, Nick Cave, Moby, Leibach, Goldfrapp, among others. Um, still, how many times did you hear that uh, Depeche Mode are too big for mute? Uh, never. <laughs> They may have heard it. People may have told them they're too big for mute, but I never heard it, no. Uh, no, I, actually, I never heard it. Other people may have said it to other people, but never to me. Why, um, why, do, you, why do you say that? Because um, <laughs> <laughs> during that time, I had the impression that there's these big major record companies that want to steal sure, the band. Sure, always, yeah. From day one, almost, actually. Uh -huh. Even before we put out the first single, or what, around the time we put out the first single, soon after I met them, they started to get some good press and they got more attention. They were doing. They hadn't really played in London much before because they were they weren't from London. Sorry, I'm not talking to them. Um, and as soon as they started playing, as soon as they started getting press, then all the majors were after them right from day one. So that was nothing, not a surprise. And 15 years without a contract. Yeah, which is so great. Um, press fast forward again. Um, in 2002, uh, Mute was bought by EMI. Um, can you tell us how this deal... It was sold to EMI, that's the difference. <laughs> Business-wise, what, what would be the major difference between... It's a proactive sale rather than a, a reactive purchase. I see. <laughs> Pro <laughs> that's an important detail, yeah. Um, How, how did the whole thing come about? Uh... Well, uh, I tell you, first of all, um, the guy who was running, uh, for we, we ha well, let's so start. We had, uh, the way we used to work internationally, we used to work with different com companies in different countries. We did label deals in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Spain with different companies, some independent, some not so independent. So we had a very long relationship with Virgin in France who were our licensee while well, they were still independent. And then, of course, over time, they got bought by EMI. The guy who was running uh, Virgin France around that time is somebody I'd known for a very long time. We'd almost started in the business together, a guy called Emmanuel de Bortel. And he was always trying to buy Mute. And I told him to fuck off on more occasions than I can remember. Um, but circumstances changed. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Britpop era. Mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of mid-90s to late-90s, which was a very, actually not a good time for Mute, um, in the UK especially, because the whole music, the media, the music scene was completely taken over by Britpop, which was, which was kind of music that I found really reactionary and boring, frankly, and I wasn't interested in it. And um, I didn't... Uh, so the kind of bands that we had on Mute... Um, of course, Nick Cave continued to do well, Depeche continued to do well, Erasure... But they were making records once every three or four years. And none of the newer bands who I liked had anything to do with Britpop. So they got, it was a very tough time at the media for those, for those artists. And we uh, started to kind of get into you know, a position where we were, financially we weren't doing so well. And I decided to, instead of doing these country by country deals, I decided if I, I could raise some money by doing a, a worldwide deal, licensing deal 
what I did was I went and talked to kind of people who I knew in the business, et cetera, et cetera, because Mute was not in a strong position. I, you know, I wasn't, what I was being offered in terms of the, everything was not really very favorable. So it was kind of a depressing time. So I wasn't sure what to do. And then luckily, well, not luckily, by skill, my, our skill and the artist's skill, Moby's play exploded. Um, you know, it was out for almost a year before it, it, we had any hits. Um, but it was like the cavalry coming over the hill to save us when we had our last bullet in the gun. And of course, that went on to sell 10 million records worldwide, which is phenomenal. And it put us back in a good position, not just financially, but also uh, per the perception of Mute was, was very good again. It was, it, I think people were finding it a bit tired, you know, because we hadn't broken any new artists. We weren't part of the Britpop thing. People were thinking, ah, oh, Mute, maybe it's over, or whatever. Then Moby was a hit, and of course, when you have one hit, then everybody thinks you're a fucking genius, and which is the nature of this business. But, but, we, but we were genius all the time, even when we weren't having hits. <laughs> That's the point. That's the difference. Um, uh, but um, so at that point, I felt in a very strong position to negotiate a deal. And it's not about the money. It was more about the conditions. So I went to Emmanuel, it was a slightly longer story than this, but basically I went to Emmanuel, I said, look, well, he came to me and said, look, can we, can we work together? So, okay. We, uh, I sort of gave him a list of the kind of conditions that I would consider doing the sale, and he kind of pretty much agreed to all of them. They were to do with, you know, autonomy, A&R freedom, um, marketing freedom, and all those kind of things. And he actually saw all those things as a positive, which was why it was... It was somebody I, would, I was looking forward to working with because he actually saw what we were doing as a positive. He wasn't always thinking in the back of his mind, oh, we should do it the EMI way. At that time, by the way, he was running EMI Continental Europe. So he was in a position to do a deal like that. And um, so, you know, one thing led to another, and we did the deal. And we started to work, and it was very, it, was, it worked very well. We were autonomous, we had our own offices. Of course, we had budget discuss budgets, but in every other respect, he left us alone to do what we wanted to do. Um, and then, you know, the top management above him changed over time, and he fell out with the top management, and, unf and so he left. So that was a pretty bad moment for us, because the people who came in were not bad people, but they didn't really understand Mute or why we were there. And gradually, as time went on, we got kind of absorbed into EMI more and more, and became exactly the opposite of what we wanted to be, which was just another EMI label, which would seem like a pointless, they already had enough labels, why should we just become another one? Mm -hmm. So that's the story, yeah. And the, the thing ended in 2009. Yeah. Um, now, since you have experienced both uh, for your work and, and in your personal opinion, um, what would be the major difference between being an independent label and being attached to a major record company? For me, um, I mean, there are a lot of differences. Oh, you know, there's a big difference between, it's not so much being independent or major, it's being your own boss and working for somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's difference number one. I'd worked for myself for the last, the previous 23 years or whatever. Um, second thing was the bureaucracy. Every decision had to be, had to go through a system to be assessed, financial, you know. So anything you wanted to do, especially if it was slightly outside the ordinary, was very hard, and that was quite dispiriting. Thirdly, we, uh, as a label, traditionally and still and today, still, were very, very focused on uh, global markets, not just the UK. I think a lot of UK labels, both major and independent, they were really focused on the UK, and everything else was secondary. That was the opposite for us. Well, not the opposite, but we saw that the markets as equal. So whether it was the UK or Germany or France, we, we started to work with the artists very early in those other markets. And that became uh, v impossible as time. It was great at the beginning with EMI, but then as time went on, that became impossible because really, like all majors, they said, well, have a hit in uh, England and then we'll think about releasing it in mm -hmm. other places. And that was very dispiriting. And although EMI never told me who I could and couldn't sign, they, it, I didn't want to sign any artists at that point because I couldn't develop them in the way that I knew best how to do it. So at that point, you know, it became clear that it wasn't going to work anymore. And they, you know, we mutually, in a fairly friendly way, parted company in 2010, I think. Uh -huh. Now, um, 
compared to that time, uh, how, how is Mute doing now in general? And, and what exactly is the situation in terms of uh, rights management and, and the back catalogue? Well, um, of course, EMI bought the back catalogue. Mm -hmm. Or they bought the company, which included the back catalogue in, uh, in 2002. Um, and then, you know, paid for its development over the period we were there. So when we left EMI, obviously they kept the back catalogue. However, they did, as part of the kind of parting agreement, they licensed some of the deeper catalogue to us. So we had some of the older catalogue that we still... They owned it, but they licensed it to us. Mm -hmm. They also licensed the name to us, so we can continue to use the name, etc., etc. A lot of the artists were you know, out of contract with EMI at the time, so they moved over to Mute, the new Mute. Some artists like Depeche, Goldfrapp, and Richard Hawley were still signed to EMI. They had co separate contracts with EMI. I continued to work with those artists on an A&R basis as part of the agreement. I enjoyed doing that. I wanted to do that. I enjoyed still, so I still kept my relationships with those artists. Um, uh, yeah. And so the catalogue was stayed with EMI. Of course, then EMI was sold to Universal. Universal had to became too big because they bought EMI, so they had to divest a lot of the catalogue. And BMG bought the mute catalogue from Universal. <laughs> so it's now with BMG. Sounds rather complicated. I wanted to buy it. I, I, I actually was trying to buy it back, but BMG offered uh, twice or three times what I was offering, so they, they managed to get it. Shame on them. Um, well, when the BMI deal was over, did you have the feeling that you... It's a restart or a new start for Mute or start all over again? It's a combination of, it wasn't starting, no, it definitely wasn't starting all over again because, you know, we had a, a roster of really great artists. We had a, st a, most of the staff came with me to the new office. In that sense, it wasn't starting from scratch because we already had active artists. Um, in many, in, in setting, in the terms of business terms, it was like starting again, setting up a business, all the systems, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which I'd never done before, really, because when I started, it, it, it evolved over 20 years into, you know, it was just me starting, and then it, when we sold to EMI, I think we had 50 staff. So it kind of evolved. Here we had to start, kind of hit the ground running with a new business. So setting up systems, distribution deals, lots of things that happened to happen quite quickly. So in some senses, it was a new business, but not a new label. For you personally, uh, what's, what's like your current projects? Um, what are you working on and how is your DJing doing? Um, well, we're currently working, I mean, we've got re lot, quite a good release schedule coming up. Um, we just released the Leibach album, the new Leibach album. Mm -hmm. uh, the Liars album, which is brilliant, just came out uh, this week. Uh, yeah, this week, last week. Um, we've got a Jan Tiersen album, a Diamond version album. Um, we're still working, we're still very actively working the Gold Frap album, which came out uh, towards the end of last year. Um, we've got people, you know, we've got Beth Jeans Houghton in the studio, who is one of our newer artists. Cold Specs, who just finished their second album. Um, there's quite a few interesting projects that I can't quite reveal to you at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so we, we've got, you know, Swans, we've got the new Swans album. I was very pleased, you know, we worked with the Swans in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they kind of, you know, Michael Jari, who leads the Swans, he's broke the Swans up effectively. And then in the last few years, he's reformed them. And they are an unbelievable, uh, unbelievably good place at the moment, musically and in every way. And so uh, we were, I was delighted that we were able to work with them again because they're a fantastic band. So, yeah, a lot of really uh, good things. I heard you DJing a couple of times. Um, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I danced. Oh, that's, well, that's, uh, all you, that's all I and, need to know. And th <laughs> the thing is that it's very skillful um, with, of course, th this is wide range of deep musical understanding. Um, I heard two, three techno sets, and I heard you played 60s records. Um, and this was very eclectic. So um, I, I was wondering, have you ever been a great uh, big record collector? Or is it just you listen to stuff mm -hmm. and you played? 
Well, there's two, two things. I mean, mainly when I DJ, I'm a techno DJ, basically. Pretty much straight down the line, techno, which is what I love to do. I love that. Occasionally, I do other things. I did a friend of mine had a, a, a birthday party the other day, and I played a 50s and 60s set, which he requested, which I really enjoyed doing. But mainly, it's techno. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a record collector. I've never been a record collector. Um, there's, not much, there's not really that much music I like. Uh, which is, uh, I think, is important when you're running a record label because if you just like everything, then it's, it becomes a bit complicated. You know, when I was, uh, you know, younger, I was really, you know, and still, you know, very ideological about what I listened to. You know, when I was a young teenager, I knew exactly what I liked and exactly what I didn't like. And why would I want to have records that I didn't like in my home, you know, because it kind of pollutes the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the same goes, you know. I don't, ha I don't even have a huge iTunes library. I mean, it's not small, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not huge. You know, most of the stuff on my iTunes library is um, techno. That's my DJ work, and also um, some of my old favourites. You know, and some and a few new things, of course. But really, it doesn't change. I'm not, a, I'm not one of these guys who's a record collector. I don't. People come to my flat. And they go, "Where's the record collection?" I said, "There isn't one." Um, these are just the records I like, you know. C could you say that you like pop music and you like uh, experimental, visionary music, but almost nothing in between? Um, Apart from techno, maybe. I don't think of it in those terms, really. I mean, I like what I like. Of course, I grew up listening to pop music, the great pop music of the 60s, you know, the Beatles, the Stones, especially like the Kinks, who I love. I think Ray Davis is probably the Britain's best ever songwriter, um, and much better, I think, than Lennon and McCartney, although they were pretty good. Um, and, uh, and I was a huge fan of that, well, that whole era. And of course, as soon as a group made a single that I didn't like, I went off them completely. And when, <laughs> because, the, well, the thing was, there's so much going on. It, things were moving so fast, you know. All of a sudden, the pretty things came out, and the Rolling Stones seemed like really lame. Like, from one day to another, they were like revolutionary and then lame because the pretty things came out and they were like super noisy and mm -hmm. longer hair. And <laughs> so it was constantly, you know, moving along. So I, but I, I grew up in that great era, which, which was I was very lucky to have. And, you know, that era ended with, exp with the beginning of ex more experimental things. Like, you know, I mean, the first Can record came out in 1968. So, I mean, it was really seamless kind of thing from, you know, Please Please Me by the Beatles to, to, to Can mm -hmm. over a five, six year period, which is incredible when you think about how music went. And so then I was on that other path. And I, it wasn't that it was, I was sick of pop music. It was just that pop music wasn't, as it was developing, was losing. I was, didn't think it was that good or that interesting or that revolutionary anymore. And I was looking for new sounds. I had sounds in my head that I was looking for kind of, you know, and I found those sounds and atmospheres in, in what was going on in Germany. Um, I'd say we have a listen to um, one of the current and latest signings uh, on Mute Records, mm -hmm. uh, Liars. Um, not Mess. that, I mean, they've been around for a while, actually. It's not a, good, yeah. it's not a new signing, but it's a, a new album. Right. Yeah. You, you signed them like 10 years ago, maybe? Yeah, this is their seventh album. Yeah. Um, called Mess. Yep. And uh, we hear Mess on a Mission. He isn't Liars.
Ayers. Great band, great tune. So, um, to wrap it up, um, we have to take a look at the future. Mm -hmm. um, questions that are always hard to answer. Um, where's, the, where's the music industry heading for? Will there be record companies in, in five or 10 or 15 years? Well, five or 10 or 15, that's three big, <laughs> big leaps. Five, um, yes, 10, maybe 15, no. Um, I mean, I think, oh, I don't know, actually. I mean, five years, I would imagine there will be people, you know, you call them, call them what you want, record companies or service companies or artists. There will be people who work with artists to help them release their records mm -hmm. or music. Whether you call that a record company or not, I don't know. You know, artists have a lot of ways of releasing music these days, just as, you know, as we did back in the late 70s. You know, I didn't need a record company. I put my own single out. Bands these days don't need record companies. They, they can put their own music out. Um, in some ways, it's easier than it, well, it, technically it's easier to do it now than it was, but at the same time, there's so much music out there that um, it's hard to get noticed. Mm -hmm. When I put my single out, when I, you know, I was hanging around the rough trade shop a lot in those days after I released it, and every new single that came in was an event. The people who listened to it, everybody sat down and listened to it. Imagine trying to do that now. I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's impossible. So, you know, what, the choices are there for art, lots of artists to work in lots of different ways. In the end, somebody has to upload it to iTunes. Somebody has to do the, uh, do, take it to radio or take it to prep. You know, all those things are what a record label does, whether it's done by a record label or by somebody else. Those functions, for the moment, are still going to be required. Some bands can do it themselves, some bands don't want to do it themselves because they got they want to make music and they want to go on tour, they don't have to worry about you know the logistics of that. So for the for that period of time there will be people who will help artists to put out their music. And in terms of making music available, what's your take on uh, the developments that uh, streaming services like Spotify have and, and YouTube video vice? You know, it's all Interesting. I mean, do I like it? Or from a personal point of view, I think it's okay. I think actually some of those sites are not that good. Uh, they're not that well, uh, they're not that friendly to use. Um, they could be better. From a business point of view, clearly until those st streaming services kind of hit a certain critical mass of, of subscribers, it's going to be hard apart from a few exceptions to make any, for the bands and the labels to make any uh, money from it, serious, you know, mm -hmm. relevant, fine. But I mean, it's there, it's building, it's definitely building. YouTube is definitely building in terms of that lovely word, monetizing, <laughs> the uh, monetizing YouTube, right. I love that word. And, um, you yeah. know, there will be other things, there'll be other streaming services, there'll be other broadcast, you know, online broadcast services that already are, lots competition i think that's good the more co the most important thing is there's competition because when you get something like itunes which really has a monopoly of download it's not it's never a healthy situation mm -hmm. because you know anybody who has that kind of power whether they realize it or not abuse it so um and that's not just itunes it's anybody who's in that kind of mon monopolistic which the state or a huge corporation so the more competition there is in any of those fields, the healthier it will be for the, for, for us, uh, labels and artists, you know. And uh, for you personally, what, what is it uh, that you still want to achieve, stuff you're heading for in the next couple of years? Well, um, you know, as far as the label is concerned, you know, we're, uh, as we discussed, we're kind of a new company, mm -hmm. but not a new label. Um, and really it's developing that, you know, I mean, what, at the heart of what I always want to do is, is work with great artists and put out music that I believe in and feel that we can work with and that I think will be mean something to people's lives, inspire people. So that's really at the core of everything we do, whether it's from a publishing point of view, we have a publishing music publishing company as well, label point of view, you know, that's, that's the core of what we do. And that's the important thing. That's what drives me is to do, just to put out music that I think is great. You know, then it's really how you do it. Um, you know, but that's what, I'm still inspired by. I think it helps, you know, because I don't like much music. 
it's it's really that's you know I'm still very focused on making sure there's stuff out there that I like, even if it's just for me, and um, you know and I, you know so so yeah we're just it's always about figuring out the best way of doing it and as you know for the artists and for the company make sure we can keep going as a label that the artists can make as much as as, as of a living as possible from it that's those and can, can you and you know maintaining a space where they feel the artists feel that they're not under pressure to be to do something they don't want to do because we only work with artists who we respect we don't you know we don't try and push them in directions they don't want to go in you know we guide them when they need guidance but it, you know it's about signing somebody who who you who you really respect and f want to work with over a long period of time and so it's it's trying to create a space that's both creative you know and business like as well because it's the music business you know so there has to be both but it's very important to maintain that creative space mm -hmm. now um unfortunately we're hitting the end um with a band that um was mentioned before, um, Kraftwerk. Um, do you actually own one of the original synths and does it does it work? I do. I'm very, very lucky to be the proud owner of their original vocoder, <laughs> which was uh, custom built for them. And you can it's actually you can actually see it on the the album Ralph and Florian. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that album. There's a great picture on the back of that record of their Kling Klang studio, and actually that picture for me was. That album came out, I don't know, 71, something like that, 72. Mm. And that picture actually was really inspiring for me because because like you'd always seen pictures of recording studios before being very formal, you know, glass, <coughs> us, them kind of thing. And theirs was just like a, on the back of that album. It's just like a workspace, a great workspace. Anyway, that vocoder is there and I, and I, I, I currently own that, which I'm very proud. Does it work? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, before we have a listen to Kraftwerk, um, last question. Do you think it's fair to say that you are the only person in the world that liked every record that was ever released on mute? Well, I'm the only person I know <laughs> who, who does. There may be people out there, God help them, uh, who... who uh, who uh, have the have the same opinion, but you know, there's just one Erasure le record that I didn't like too much. Okay. Apart from that, I'm, I'm close. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Geht wahrscheinlich vielen ähnlich. Äh, es werden viel mehr Leute auf der Welt sein, die auch alle Platten mögen, die jemals bei Mute erschienen sind. Ähm, wir hören jetzt noch kurz in den Remix eines Kraftwerk Songs rein. Um, you re-released the Kraftwerk albums, right, on Mute? Well, kind of, yes. I mean, when we were at EMI, uh, Kraftwerk were also signed to EMI. Um, the EMI label in the UK, which released Kraftwerk, actually closed down. There was no more EMI record label. Mm -hmm. And the guy who was their product manager was, became our marketing head of marketing. And he was very close to the band. Somebody had to put out the reissues. And so it was clear that uh, it would be mute within EMI, doing it you know, with this guy. And I had a bit of a relationship with Kraftwerk. I didn't know them very well, but I'd met them a few times and they wanted it to be through mute, so that was great. Mm -hmm. It was kind of difficult to kind of get my head around, the fact that Kraftwerk were on mute, but I managed. And it was the same with Can as well, because Can, the Can catalog, we've worked for many, many years. It's difficult working with your heroes sometimes, but it, you know. <laughs> ja, meine Damen und Herren. Uh das war das Keynote-Gespräch mit Daniel Miller von Mute Records. Ähm, ich denke mal, dass Daniel noch ein Weilchen hier ist und vielleicht noch ein, zwei Fragen von euch beantwortet, wenn ihr die ganz dringend auf dem Herzen habt. Ansonsten möchte ich mich sehr, sehr herzlich für euer Interesse bedanken. Ähm, und natürlich in erster Linie bei Daniel Miller, dass er hier war. Thank you very much for joining us and being here, Daniel, and answering all my questions. Um, All the best with Mute Records thank in the future. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting, for inviting me. Thank you to Rito and everybody at the organization. Ja, dann wünsche ich euch äh, zu den Klängen von Kraftwerk und Trans Europa Express noch einen äh, weiteren schönen Abend äh, 
Und wir sehen uns bestimmt ganz bald wieder hier in Zürich in der Schweiz. Danke. Danke.